mummies. Each one's an encyclopedia. A tooth can tell you when they were sick. A hair, what they ate. An x-ray can tell you how they died. It's as if they've cheated time so they can tell us their secrets. They're stalkers from an ancient land. They've been buried alive and they're out for revenge. So you'd better watch out. Mummies are Hollywood's ultimate terror. Let me go! Let me go! Until you get to know them. In the movies, the mummy always meets a grisly end. Straining frantically against his wrappings, he's buried alive for committing some unspeakable crime. The mummy movies play on the fear of being buried alive. In the 19th century, it was a real possibility. It wasn't always easy to tell if a person was actually dead or in a coma. A doctor wasn't always present to sign the death certificate. To guard against being buried alive, coffins were designed to prevent premature burial. If the deceased suddenly awoke, the slightest twitch of a finger would ring a bell. I hope you get this in the oh, huh? I hope so, too. Hopefully, someone would hear the bell and grave diggers would frantically dig you up. As long as it keeps ringing. Right. Right there. And presto, you're saved from a terrible fate. But you know, being buried alive is pure Hollywood. We don't know of a single Egyptian mummy that was buried alive. And they certainly didn't come out of their coffins and prowl graveyards. Hollywood mummies are a lot of fun to watch. But for me, Mummies are more about science and knowledge than they are about screams and horror. I'll show you. This is the kind of mummy I'm used to. Emory University's Michael C. Carlos Museum has just acquired a new mummy, a mystery woman. So we're going to try to find out who she is. Time has not been kind to our mummy, and today she's in a sad state. Now we'll see what we can do for her. I think the, the, the pattern of the wrappings, the way they're damaged, is, is really tomb robbing. Uh, it, it's typical, where you get it in the chest area, they're looking for an amulet, they're looking for jewelry, and then by the hand, looking for bracelets and stuff like that. But the feet, nobody ever put amulets by the feet or anything like that, so that's why the feet are in pretty good shape. So who is she? Her coffin says she's Lady Tahat. She has two titles, Lady of the House, she was a housewife, and Chantress of Amun. She was a singer in the temple of the god Amun. There she is, making an offering of incense to the gods. But do we really have Lady Tahat? Often, when mummies and coffins were sold to tourists in the 19th century, it was a case of musical mummies. You don't want the mummy, just the coffin? No problem, we'll take out the mummy. Later, when someone else wanted a coffin with a mummy, the dealer would find a spare mummy and put it in the case. So we're not sure if our mummy is Lady Tahat, singer of Amun. That's one thing we'll try to figure out today. Mummy wrappings are an important part of any mummy study. So I'm happy to have Mimi Levesque, a textile conservator, working with me. Yeah. What do you think from, from the quality of the linen? This would be a wealthy person because there's a lot of fine linen in there? Or? It's hard to say. It's not fancy linen, but there's certainly a lot of nice linen. So it's possible that her own garments were used. I'll move this. Okay. And you pull that off. 
Can we have a bag for this? Baggy, and we think, we, and mark it with piece of skin from left hand. The first step in conserving That's Lady Tahat is to do some unwrapping good, good. so we can get a good look at her. That's good. This is a chance to get up close and personal to see what we can learn from a mummy. As recently as the 19th century, mummy unwrappings were social events. Invitations would be sent, friends would gather, a local physician would do the unwrapping, and a good time would be had by all. But even when mummies of pharaohs were unwrapped, few records were kept, and all that remained at the end was a naked king and tattered bandages. Today, a mummy unwrapping is a team effort. Conservators, radiologists, textile experts, Egyptologists, all work together. And after we've completed our examination, Lady Tahat will be rewrapped. X-rays will tell us a lot about our mummy. So here we're looking at the pelvis. Dr. Bearfield quickly determines that the mummy is indeed a female. Now, how can you tell sex? How do we know we're looking at a female pelvis, for example? Well, the general shape of the pelvis, the widest wide right in through mm -hmm. here, it looks much more like a, a champagne glass as uh -huh. opposed to a wine glass. For <laughs> the male, it looks very deep down in here. With a female mummy, we may indeed have Lady Tahat, but we need more information. X-rays are good for broad views. CAT scans are what we use for the details. They reveal that the embalmers were not very careful. Now, normally the, the embalmers broke through the cribriform plate mm -hmm. to take out the brain, but is, is ours complete in here? It looks like it is. Uh, the central portion of the cribriform plate and the skull here is the Christi Galley. Right. And just posterior to that is the cribriform plate And it's itself. perfectly intact, right? Looks like it's intact. These in a top-of-the-line mummification, the brain should have been removed through the nose. The CAT scans show that the bones are not broken. Lady Tahat's brain was left intact by the not-so-conscientious embalmers. From the CAT scans, Dr. Torres has created what we call a fly-through. We're going to fly inside the cranium to see what we can find. That's nice. That's the groove from the, from the, from the cranial vessels. Right. These are where the vessels would be. And, and along the, the external of the, of the brain. Skull, right? Those grooves are the indentations made by the blood vessels of the brain. That's normal. We all have them. There's the brain at the bottom of the screen. It's shrunk considerably over 2,000 years. X-rays and CAT scans have helped quite a bit. But now it's time for a new high-tech tool. Steve Goldschmidt is master of the endoscope. Basically, a flexible wire with a miniature camera at the end. The lungs should have been removed and preserved in a special jar. But Goldschmidt finds the lungs in the chest cavity. Our embalmers were really lazy. The lungs were left intact, which is kind of not great embalming. Oh, that's nice. You can see the whole thing. We know we have a female, and she was poorly mummified. But is she Lady Tahat? Stuck in the bottom of the coffin are bandages from the original occupant. If the coffin bandages match tears on the back of our mummy, we can be pretty sure we have Lady Tahat. Do you want me to adjust the light, or is it still okay? It's still great. Oh, I can certainly see quite clearly this. There's a knot right here. Uh huh. It looks like it ends very similarly to the cut end of the one that's, or the torn in, end of the, the one that's on the coffin. Coffin, yep. Now Mimi does the final test to see if we really do have Lady Tahat. Does the cloth match? It's exactly the same weave. Yep. Our mummy is indeed Lady Tahat. Modern science has helped identify and recreate the life of an ancient Egyptian. But mummy science is more far-reaching than just Egypt. One mummy study has recently solved one of the greatest mysteries of the 19th century. What ever happened to the Franklin expedition? In 1845, two ships under the command of Sir John Franklin left England to discover a passage through the frozen waters of North America to the riches of China and India, the fabled Northwest Passage. The Franklin expedition 
was the best equipped Arctic venture in history. They were the first ever to have cabins heated by hot water piped beneath the floors. In the winter, the passages freeze and ships are trapped, sometimes crushed. Franklin's two ships were fitted with iron planks to protect the bows. They brought huge quantities of food, enough for five years. But the most innovative provisions were tinned foods, a recent invention. 8,000 cans of meat, soup, vegetables were loaded onto the two ships when they left England in May of 1845. On July 9th, the ships encountered two whaling vessels in Baffin Bay. Franklin and his 128 men sailed north, never to be seen again. The Franklin expedition became a national cause for Victorian England. Her Majesty's government offered a 20,000 pound reward to anyone who could find and assist the expedition. In August of 1850, the first traces of the expedition were found, empty food tins. Then, on Beachy Island, three marked graves were found of William Brain, age 32, John Hartnell, age 25, and John Torrington, age 20. In 1854, a local Inuit reported that Franklin's party had been seen crossing the ice after its ship had been crushed by the frozen sea. Finally, a lifeboat was found, containing two human skeletons, still in their clothes, holding double-barreled guns. The lifeboat was loaded with a bizarre assortment of items, toothbrushes, soap, books, even a writing desk. In their demented state, the crew had attempted to pull useless items across the ice to civilization. As the decades passed, no one ever learned what had happened to the 129 men. They simply disappeared into history. In 1981, forensic anthropologist Dr. Owen Beatty began to unravel the mystery of the lost Franklin expedition. In the areas where traces of the expedition had been found, he recovered human bone fragments. Back in his laboratory at the University of Alberta, he discovered that they contained 10 times as much lead as normal. Did the Franklin expedition die of lead poisoning? But were the bones really from the expedition members? In 1986, Beatty and a research team flew to Beachy Island to examine the three frozen mummies of the buried expedition members. Beneath the permafrost, a coffin began to emerge. The team heated snow to pour on the coffin to thaw it so the lid could be lifted. Careful. Then the team came face to face with John Hartnell, 25-year-old able-bodied seaman. He was perfectly preserved. Button right there, nice button. And a red beard. Hello. Uh, he's been yeah. autopsied. He's been autopsied. Oh. And why incision? We've got an upside down Y. Yeah. Now this sort of thing has never been seen before. This is absolutely unique. The ship's surgeon, Here. more than a century earlier, had attempted just what Owen Beatty was doing trying to find out what killed John Hartnell. Beatty took samples of hair, bone, and tissue for later analysis, and then moved on to the body of William Brain. It's loose down here. Brain weighed less than 90 pounds. Signs of a long, lingering illness. Get that? Samples were taken and flown to the University of Alberta Hospital for analysis. Lead is a relatively stable metal and remains in the body. 
if the Franklin expedition somehow collectively suffered from lead poisoning, then the mummies from Beachy Island would still contain the lead. The tests confirmed this. Both Hartnell and Brain had tuberculosis and pneumonia and had died of the weaknesses brought on by lead poisoning. The cause of the poisoning was modern technology, the tinned foods. The cans had been soldered with lead that contaminated the food inside. As the crew ate their rations, they were slowly poisoning themselves. Along with the weakened physical condition came impaired mental judgment. That's why they died dragging a writing desk across the Arctic ice. Today, John Torrington, John Hartnell, and William Brain lie in their icy graves on Beachy Island, where they should remain unchanged for centuries. They are not the only frozen mummies to have recently revealed their secrets. Far from Beachy Island, high on an Andean mountain peak, the frozen mummies of three children have a very different story to tell. They were only children, but they had to die so the rest could live. They're probably the most important mummy find of the 20th century, and scientists are only now discovering their full story. A story that begins at South America's most mysterious site, Machu Picchu. Peru's Machu Picchu is so remote that it wasn't discovered until 1911 by the American explorer Hiram Bingham. Bingham thought he had found the legendary lost city where the virgins of the sun served the Inca king. It all made sense. Fortified location, amazing architecture. This was a city fit for a king. Bingham's expedition searched the jungle around Machu Picchu for caves, which they thought might be good burial sites. I want to show you one of them. Come on in here. When Bingham's expedition reached here, they found scattered human remains, mostly skeletons. And when Bingham was told that the skeletons were mostly female, he was absolutely convinced he had found the lost Inca city. You see, he thought the skeletons were of the virgins of the sun who served the Inca king. But Bingham was wrong. He hadn't found the fabled city he was looking for. That was for later archaeologists to discover. And the bones of the Virgins of the Sun? Modern anthropologists recently determined they were half males and half females. Just burials of Machu Picchu's middle-class residents. But why build in such a high and remote place? I'm from the Bronx. I wouldn't put a housing development here. Yeah, you forget the river goes all the way down, right? Is it going to rain on us? Well, if it doesn't, it'll be a first, huh? For the real scoop, I turned to Dr. Johann Reinhardt. So why'd they build it here, Joe? Yeah, that was the question that I asked, too, when I first came here. The setting is what first struck me, because we know the Incas considered the mountains that are around here sacred. And when you get into this particular place, you have a bunch of things take place, which is just unique. This place is the center, the sacred center for the Incas. An elaborately carved rock called the Hitching Post of the Sun is the heart of Machu Picchu, and it rests on a piece of real estate unique in all the world. If you draw lines from the Hitching Post to do north, south, east, and west, you run smack into four sacred mountains. Even more amazing, if you stand at the Hitching Post, during the equinoxes, when there are equal periods of day and night, you will see the sun rising behind one of the Inca's most sacred mountains, 
It's the hitching post's relationship to mountains that makes it so special. Machu Picchu is about mountains. That's why the place is sacred. That's why the ink is built here. And that's why, 500 years ago, Inca children were led to their deaths on the top of Mount Yuyuyaco, one of the Inca's most sacred places. Understanding the Inca mind is what led Johann Reinhardt to make the most important mummy discovery of the last hundred years. It's the realization of how important sacred landscape was to the Incas that helps you understand why they would then go to the trouble of reaching heights 22,000 feet. They not only reached those heights, they built structures up there and of course ended up even carrying young children up there in order to be sacrificed. Well, I picked Yuyayako because uh, at 22,000 feet, it has the world's highest archeological site. And I figured if we were ever going to find perfectly frozen mummies, it would have to be there. What was the hardest part for you getting up there? <laughs> getting up there was just carrying the gear up, I think. It was maybe, uh, getting my own body up with something else. But uh, we had to carry fairly heavy loads because we were going to stay. At 22,000 feet, it's obviously difficult to breathe and so forth. So the hardest part is, I guess, just uh, carrying that heavy pack to that altitude. We've worked on several of these mountain top ruins uh, before, and the ceremonial platforms that they build are pretty obvious. And we knew that at least that was the first place to start. Then from there, you can expand out, and that's what we did. But actually, all three mummies we ended up finding were right in that platform. We found three mummies. One boy and two girls. Both females had artifacts that were very similar. In other words, we had your ceramics, different kinds of pots, uh, female clothes, statues, gold, silver. One of the mummies had been hit by lightning when it was buried, not, not uh, while it was still alive. In this case, the lightning had burned the cloth and it virtually almost slipped aside. And then all of a sudden, you're looking straight into the eyes of a 500-year-old child, <laughs> child about 10 years old. These weren't the children of their enemies. They were their own sons and daughters. To appease the mountain gods, the Incas were offering their most precious possession, their children. They had to die so others could live. Reinhardt's Inca mummies are exciting, but I think we're only seeing the beginning. These frozen sacrifices are as close to living Incas as we will ever get. The blood is still frozen in their veins. Their DNA is perfectly preserved. These precious mummies are kept permanently frozen, so the secrets they hold will not be lost. Take it from me, scientists in the future We'll be discovering things about them that would sound like science fiction today. Under extreme conditions of either cold or heat, bodies can quickly become natural mummies. One of the strangest natural mummies is on display at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. They have all sorts of great things. A wax model of Madame de Marche, who grew a horn from her head. The incredibly large colon of a man who had a world record case of constipation. This is a plaster cast of Eng and Chang, the original Siamese twins. Down here is their real liver. They were joined there. So when one died, a few hours later, the other died also. But that's not why we're here. Let me show you something else. The museum has lots of wonderful things. But this is why I came here, the soap lady. We don't know her name, but she was discovered more than 100 years ago when they were moving an old Philadelphia cemetery. When conditions are just right, humidity, temperature, soil, the fats in the body form adipocere. That's Latin for fat and wax. She's basically a big bar of soap. Her adipocere preserved her 
which is why the soap lady didn't turn to dust and is still with us. She's a natural mummy, but some man-made mummies are just as strange. Mummies have been created for all kinds of reasons. At one point, mummies were crucial to the development of medicine. You see, in the early days of modern medicine, a few medical students would gather around their professor, dressed in his Sunday best, to watch him dissect a cadaver. This was a big deal. Cadavers weren't readily available. There were no body donor programs. The bodies came mainly from executed criminals or grave robbing. When the number of medical students grew, the University of Maryland's Davidge Hall was built to accommodate the larger classes. But there was a problem. Imagine the year is 1815. I'm an anatomy professor about to give a lecture on the cardiovascular system. My cadaver would be here. And now I want to point out to my students the carotid artery. Now I'm a student. I came to class late, and all I could get was this crummy seat in the back. I can't see very well. I certainly can't see the carotid artery. And the body's not going to be around very long. There's no refrigeration. How am I going to learn my anatomy? How am I ever going to become a doctor? This mummy's the solution. It's a human body prepared more than 200 years ago by Alan Burns, a Scottish anatomist. It's not going to decay. We could even pass it to the back row for our student to see. Now we can see the carotid artery and become a doctor. Burns preserved his mummies with sugar and salt, something like a sugar-cured ham. If he wanted to illustrate the vascular system associated with the carotid artery, he would inject colored wax into the vessels so you could see them clearly. 200 years ago, these mummies were the cutting edge of medical technology. Today, another group of mummies is revealing something shocking about life in ancient Egypt. Turin's Anthropology Museum houses the entire population of an Egyptian city. It's just that they've been dead for thousands of years. The 2,000 mummies are a unique chance to study life and death in ancient Egypt. Dr. Nicoletta Saruti has found something very unusual in these mummies. Normally, a skull is translucent. Light passes through it. But many of these skulls are unusually thick, often a sign of anemia. In a desperate attempt to produce red blood cells, the bone thickens. But what caused the anemia? One possibility is malaria. 50 centuries ago, the area where these long dead Egyptians lived was humid, a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. Now, Dr. Saruti and her colleague, Dr. Emma Rabino, will apply modern immunological techniques to see if malaria was the cause of the anemia. The principle is simple. Parasites that invade your body create specific proteins, and your body rallies to your defense and attempts to destroy the invading organism. Once the battle is over and you've won, you're left with immunes, markers that you've had the disease. Now, using modern immunological methods, the Turin scientists will see if they can detect malaria in the mummies. Bone from the mummies is pulverized and rehydrated so a protein specific to malaria can be detected. If the protein is there, it will react with the test strip and form a line across it. Sure enough, there it is. These people had malaria. Saruti and Rubino have found malaria in 40% of their mummies, a virtual epidemic. With no quinine to combat it, the ancient Egyptians would have had a difficult time fighting off the malaria. They were probably always tired and anemic, but never knew they were sick. This was life for them.
Many people view the Egyptians as a happy-go-lucky civilization, living idyllic lives on the Nile. The Turin research, however, suggests the Egyptians were plagued with illness and highlights just how incredible the ancient Egyptians really were. The monuments that amaze us even today were built by people, many of whom were sick all the time. If it moved, the ancient Egyptians mummified it. Snakes, birds, bulls, they all wound up mummified. Animal mummies were big business. If you want to see how big, go to the Falcon Gallery at Saqqara, ancient Egypt's greatest cemetery. There, stacked neatly, are millions of mummified falcons, offerings to the gods. If you were sick and wanted to be healed, you made a pilgrimage to this place and bought a mummified falcon to be left as an offering to the god of healing and there were thousands of pilgrims who came here. But there's a mystery here. Where did all the falcons come from? Ibises, crocodiles, cats could be raised in captivity. But falcons are wild birds. You can't breed them by the millions. The answer is at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut. Now just keep your hand on it. Quinnipiac's Bioanthropology Institute includes a team of three radiologists who specialize in x-raying mummies. I love these guys. They're wild men. Ron Beckett, Jerry Conalog, and Bill Hennessy will go anywhere in the world to x-ray a mummy. This x-ray of an ibis mummy from Yale's Peabody Museum looks exactly as it should, with its long beak showing up bright and clear on the x-ray. But I'm more interested in the falcon mummy they're x-raying. Okay, all set. The moment of truth. All right, let's see what we got. Put it up on right, that side. Use a regular standard X-ray. Oh, it's a fake. <laughs> yes. There's yes. Nothing there. No bones there's at no all. No bones. Compared to the ibis. Yeah, the ibis. You can see bones all over the place. Even the beak, very mm -hmm. nice. Very nice. But here, there's absolutely nothing. Absolutely. Wow. Let's right. look at the detail of the head. Yeah. Here. Hey, look at that. Yeah. Nothing there, though. You still see no the bones. Resin shows up nice. Yeah, so we have a, mm -hmm. a fake, a dummy mummy, right? Absolutely. Well, thank you, this is good. Yeah, you're welcome. Better luck next time. Yeah. <laughs> the mummified falcon business was a multi-million dollar fraud. We're just 2,000 years too late to do anything about it. At about the same time that Egyptian embalmers were cheating their clients, halfway around the world, Chinese embalmers were performing a mummification so spectacular that scientists today still don't know how they did it. It isn't surprising that the people who invented gunpowder, printing, and my favorite, pasta, also produced the most remarkable mummy of the ancient world. When this mummy was discovered in 1972, Chinese scientists couldn't believe their eyes. The body was more than 2,000 years old but its limbs were still flexible. Look at how they keep poking it. They can't believe it. This is a mummy the West hardly knows about, and we'll get a closer look at it later. But to understand just how incredible this mummy is, let's first look at another amazing Chinese mummy, one even Chinese scientists haven't studied. So our journey starts in Guilin, in southern China. This is the place that inspired centuries of Chinese artists. You know, all those mysterious, misty mountain peaks? This mummy isn't exactly where you'd expect to find a mummy, in a lovely Buddhist temple. It was discovered in its tomb a few years ago and is now kept here in a formaldehyde solution to preserve it. <laughs> Once a year, a small team of dedicated technicians make the trip to Guilin to change the formaldehyde. I plan my visit so I could be there on the day they change the solution. I wanted to see this mummy up close. 
There's no question about it. It wasn't eviscerated. The internal organs are still inside because there's no incision. And, and that's what makes it really amazing. The thing is so well preserved, even though the organs are inside it. You can still see the fingernails. That's another really nice touch. They're in beautiful condition, the hands. Over here, you, you can see the mouth. He lost a lot of teeth during his lifetime, and you can tell because the mandible, the jaw, the sockets for the teeth have absorbed again. They're, they're filled in completely, and that takes years. And you can still see the earplug here. All the orifices, the ear, the nostrils, they're, they're plugged with, with linen. The idea was that the uh, vital, or, vital fluids wouldn't leave the body. The brain and internal organs decay rapidly. So Egyptians removed them when they mummified their dead. Somehow, 500 years ago, the Chinese preserved this mummy without removing the brain or organs. The Chinese were pretty good, huh? Now let's look at their best, the amazing flexible mummy I showed you before. The Marquise of Tai died more than 20 centuries ago, but her limbs are still flexible. Her skin, soft to the touch. She's the best preserved ancient mummy in the world. Her tomb in Changsha was discovered because Chairman Mao was afraid Russia was going to bomb China. So he ordered hospitals to be built underground and in mountainsides for protection. Workers started tunneling into one of the mounds at Changsha to build a hospital there. When the workmen reached about here, they took a break. One of the men lit a cigarette and the walls were covered with blue flames. They ran out thinking it was ghosts. It was just a small pocket of methane gas. What they didn't realize is that they were about to make one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of all time. This was China's equivalent of Tutankhamun's tomb. An undisturbed tomb packed with treasures. But because of the Cold War, the West hardly knows about it. Four months of excavation uncovered a huge sunken tomb constructed of wood with chambers for all of the Marquise's possessions. The Marquise liked her comforts and brought a small army of servants for the next world. She also liked her food. Excavators found piles of food, hundreds of bowls and pitchers that still held water. Wonderful stuff, but to me, the greatest treasure was the mummy. Carved lacquered coffins held her body. When the coffins were dismantled, there she was, the Lady Chang, Marquise of Tai, wife of the governor of the province. She's not pretty, but she's the most amazing mummy the ancient world ever produced. Come over here. I want to show you something just as incredible. These are her internal organs, and these are the intestines. We all have about 22 feet of them. They look pretty much like intestines you might find in the anatomy lab of my university, of somebody who died two weeks ago, except these are 2,000 years old. Because of her amazing condition, it was possible to perform a nearly normal autopsy to determine the cause of death. The Marquise was about 50 years old when she died and considerably overweight. All the food and utensils in the tomb suggested she liked to eat. And the autopsy revealed that her eating probably did her in. Her stomach contained 138 mushmelon seeds, the remains of her last meal. That's not bad. At least it's low in cholesterol. But her arteries, especially the coronary artery, were clogged with plaque. By itself, this might not have been fatal, but a gallstone completely blocked the lower end of the bile duct, increasing pressure on her clogged arteries. She probably died of a heart attack. I bet you're wondering, how'd they do that? How is it possible 
to preserve a mummy for 2,000 years so it's still flexible with all the internal organs intact. The innermost of her three lacquered coffins was filled with gallons of a mysterious yellow liquid. Was this liquid the secret to her preservation? Scientists analyzed it and discovered it contained mercury. My bet is that's the key. Mercury has antibacterial properties. That's why the Marquise's body remained its suspended animation for 2,000 years. The Marquise of Tai may have been China's best preserved mummy, but she wasn't the last. The Marquise was buried deep in the ground. To find our next mummy, I had to go to the top of one of China's most sacred mountains, Zhuashan. For the Chinese, a mountain is important not for its height, but for its holiness. For centuries, Buddhist monks have built their monasteries on mountaintops, far from the hustle and bustle of the mundane world. There's no road to the monastery. The only way up is by steps worn smooth by thousands of pilgrims. Four hundred years ago, a monk named Wu Sha came to this mountain and stayed for the rest of his life. For 28 years, this pious monk copied Buddhist scriptures using ink made from his own blood mixed with powdered gold. This is why I came here. That's a very special statue. Look closely at it. It's not what you think. Come over here. That's not a statue. That's Wu Xia. When he died, his fellow monks gilded him. That's a 400-year-old human being you're looking at. You see, a lot of people don't believe that it's really Wu Xia. They think it's a statue. But believe me, that's him. Look closely at the elbow, at the arm bones. They're just right. No Buddhist sculptor would have done it that way 400 years ago. That's a human being. You see the strange position of his arms? There's a wonderful story about that. A couple of hundred years ago, there was a fire in the monastery. When the monks rushed to save the mummy of Wu Xia from the flames, his body was mysteriously too heavy to move. So the monks prayed. Wu Xia's arms rose to their present position, a sign of protection. The fire stopped, and the monastery was saved. So here, the monk Wu Xia sits, so holy, so removed from the physical world, that his body remains incorruptible. But it's not just the Buddhists who believe the bodies of saintly people don't decay. I'm going to show you a remarkable examination of the body of a saint. In the shadow of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, Dr. Gino Fornaciari, Italy's leading mummy expert, is examining an elderly patient. When Christopher Columbus was trying to raise money to sail to America, this lady was the wife of a rector in charge of a medieval hospital. But she's not Dr. Fornachari's only patient. He also investigates saints. It's a long road to sainthood. First, a saint must be virtuous to a heroic extent. Sometimes, the miraculous preservation of the body is considered evidence of saintliness. There it comes. Good. Oh, nice, oh, good teeth, good right? Man. The teeth are yes. good. And she has both eyes, right? Yes. Is the other one there? Right. Yeah. Any cavities in the teeth? Yeah. No, no. No, no oh, cavities. Oh. No? Not She's nice. Yeah. The white Today, Fornachari is investigating the mummy of the Blessed Christina of Spoleto. 
where she has been an object of veneration for nearly five centuries. But no one has examined her for all that time. Back in here. Yes. And then if you can go straight, right? I got lucky. He asked me to come along to have a look at her. It would, of course, be most interesting if she were not mummified artificially, a candidate for miraculous preservation. Yes. It's okay? Okay. Yes, yes. Well, there she is. But soon after we begin the examination, it's clear that her preservation is not miraculous. Mm -hmm. Christina has been prepared artificially, and in a way neither of us has ever seen. Is this the incision where they remove the organs? The thorax incision. Yes. So they started all the way up? Yes. But nobody does that, yeah. right? This, yeah. this is not a professional, yes? Yeah. They weren't medical people. Yes. Whoever yes. did it. This was clearly done by amateurs. And, uh, Perhaps nuns from her convent wanting to keep Christina with them forever. They did it the hard way, sawing through the chest, like open heart surgery. But Beata Christina was full of surprises. Now, she, she was very heavy also because of the skin here. And, yes. But isn't that surprising for a saint? The, this individual was, uh, in my opinion, uh, very fat. Could it be that it's a pathological condition, yes. that there was something? Yes, but because it's, it's, it's very large. Right. Very you, large. I mean, very large. The, all of the skin, she must have had legs like yes. this. And she's short. Fat, I think. Yeah. Obesity doesn't quite fit with the life of austerity she was said to have lived. It also doesn't fit with other evidence. Her teeth have two lines going across them. We call it hyperplasia. It's a sign of prolonged stress to the body. When the body is stressed, it doesn't absorb nutrients, doesn't grow. Beata Christina had two serious episodes of illness or malnutrition. So why was she so fat at the time of her death? She may have had some pathological condition that caused it towards the end of her 22-year life. Beata Christina was not giving up her secrets. Yes. 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 Good. The left, yes. Yes. Good. Now okay. it's a tight fit, so. Yes. Dr. Fornichari was the first to examine Christina of Spoleto in 500 years. Now it was time to return Christina to her gilded coffin. Ritually sealed by the priests of the church, there she will remain, undisturbed, I suspect for a very long time. I bet you didn't know that popes are mummified. There's a surprising similarity between the beliefs of the ancient Egyptians and Catholics. They're both resurrectionists. And as Christ vicar on earth, the Pope will need his complete body on Judgment Day. So a tremendous effort is made to preserve the Pope's body. Unfortunately, in 1958, a new method of embalming was tried for Pope Pius XII, the Pope accused by some of having Nazi sympathies. The new method backfired. And as the Pope lay in state, strange noises emanated from the coffin as the body started to decay. The stench became so overwhelming that one of the guards fainted. Plans are already in hand to ensure a better fate for Pope John Paul II. As a matter of fact, when he was shot in 1981, the doctors had to remove part of his intestine, and it was carefully put aside and embalmed. Just like an Egyptian mummy, he will be complete for resurrection. Like I said, mummies are encyclopedias, each with a different story to tell. But in the end, it's the same. Popes, ancient Egyptians, Chinese, I think they're all on the same path. Mankind's oldest journey, the quest for immortality. <laughs>